So we got a crazy article in the in the Guardian, and the title is Putin is already at war with Europe. There is only one way to stop him. No kidding. This is in a mainstream newspaper, and it's written by this guy, Simon Tisdall. He is a foreign affairs commentator. He has been foreign lead writer, a foreign editor, and U.S. editor for The Guardian. So now you're going to know why uh, the West has been setting the world on fire if people like those are the ones who are supposed to be reporting on foreign wars and stuff. So here, let's get through this real fast, and then Aaron will comment on it. Like shockwaves from an exploding missile. Vladimir Putin's war on Europe's edge is rapidly rolling westwards, blasting its way through the front doors of homes, businesses, and workplaces from Berlin to Birmingham. Its fallout seeds a toxic rain of instability, hardship, and fear. Now, Aaron, let me just bring you in on this first paragraph. He's acting like Vladimir Putin is doing what the Nazis did in World War II, and they're trying to roll over Europe and take it over. And that's what he's trying to do, right? And he's writing it with what he thinks is such beautiful prose. Yes, yes, he is. <laughs> you know what he wrote that he's like, this is this is good stuff. <laughs> I'm nailing it. This is this is real penmanship. <laughs> yeah, of course, that's exactly what he's doing. He's trying to set up the the scene of Vladimir Putin being akin to Hitler. So and, you're exactly right. But and and he's lucky that no one really knows the history of Ukraine and the fact that that is not what Putin is doing, and that that the the country of Ukraine's government has been actually shelling and killing people in their eastern part of their own country for the last eight years against a peace agreement. And so he's just ban he's just banking on the fact that no one knows this information, and that Putin has no plans to go farther. And no one thinks he does except people like this. Okay. The idea the Ukraine conflict could be confined to Ukraine, NATO's politically convenient grand delusion, and that Western sanctions and arms supplies would stop the Russians was always a nonsense. So he's going right. He's just making things up. The idea that Ukraine's conflict could be confined to Ukraine, it certainly has been and could be and will be. Uh, unless guys like this get his way. Exactly. R Russian Russians were always now enraged by Kiev's stubborn resistance and hell bent on punishing his punishers. Putin's aim is the immiseration of Europe. Now, immiseration just means he wants to make Europe miserable. Their conditions of life to be miserable. That's what Putin's aim is. That is not what Putin's aim is. Putin's at, what what would you say Putin's aim is if you had to take a guess Aaron His aim is to stop Ukraine from becoming a NATO proxy on Russia's border which has been the US official US policy since 2008 when they enshrined it in the Bucharest declaration and accelerated in 2014 with the US back coup It's also to put an end to the war in the Donbas which the US refused to end There was an agreement as you alluded to 2015 the Minsk Accords to end the war between people who rose up against the U.S.-backed coup government in 2014 uh, and the coup government. That, that, was the, that was the terms of the agreement. The U.S. and Kiev refused to implement it. The president who signed uh, Minsk, the, the Minsk Accords, what they're called, Poroshenko, recently admitted that they were using the Minsk Accords to delay the war and build up their armed forces. So they never had any intention of actually reaching peace. So this is Putin's way of responding after all efforts to stop the war and stop Ukraine's integration into NATO uh, didn't succeed. Uh, Russia tried to resolve this diplomatically for a long time. It just, the U.S. wasn't interested in it. And now he goes on in this article to blame Russia and Putin for the effects of the sanctions that the West has put on Russia. Watch this. This is interesting. A long, cold, calamity-filled European winter. But this guy is something. This is such fucking so high school sophomore English lit writing. Huh. This is such <laughs> garbage. A long, cold, calamity-filled European winter of power shortages and turmoil looms. Yeah, you know why? Because the West is freaking doing sanctions and they would and they did a coup and they wouldn't stop bombing the dust. This has been provoked by the West and NATO, and NATO wouldn't stop trying to publicly look like they were trying to annex Ukraine into NATO. And like a coin-fed gas meter, the price of Western leaders' timidity and short-sightedness ticks upwards by the hour. This guy is such a shitty writer. 
Russia's destabilization operations, social media manipulation, cyber attacks, diplomatic double talk, nuclear blackmail, plus its unrelenting slaughter of civilians in Ukraine will only intensify Europe's state of siege in the months ahead. Boy, that, that is like... He, he should get an award for the most propagandic single paragraph in during the war. <laughs> I think he would win. The West fancif fanciful belief. That's my favorite cat food. The West fanciful <laughs> belief it could avoid continent wide escalation is evaporating fast. Aaron, that's not true at all, is it? That you think this is going to be a continent wide? First of all, could you talk about how he's blaming Russia for the uh, sanctions that the West has put on Russia? Go ahead. Yeah, Jimmy, look, if Putin's goal was to immiserate Europe, as this guy says, then why was Putin building a $11 billion Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, which would bring energy even faster to Germany and thus the rest of Europe? That was the whole thing. That was the whole project that Russia was really excited about. Guess who stopped that? It was the US, both Trump, with Obama, Trump, and then Biden tried to stop this pipeline and Biden succeeded when, when he finally provoked Russia into invading. So it's been the US goal to try to cut Russia off from the rest of Europe because they didn't want to see Russia integrated with the rest of Europe by giving it energy. And they're willing to sacrifice Europeans, not just Ukrainians, but Europeans as well, forcing them to ration gas. That's, that's the result now of both succeeding in canceling the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline and then imposing these sanctions on Russia that make it uh, harder for Russian energy to get to the rest of Europe. And what's amazing is even after this crisis began or escalated with Russia's invasion, even after all these sanctions were imposed on Russia and Europe and the U.S. were sending advanced weaponry to Ukraine that is killing Russians, Russia has still been supplying energy to the rest of Europe. I know. So if their goal really was to emissiate Europe, then why are they giving, still giving them energy? They could cut it off, you know, but they haven't because they don't want to see an endless war. They just want to see their security uh, interests as they apply to Ukraine resolved, which the U.S. has refused to do. So that's why when he talks about uh, uh, the West timidity, if, if the West means the leaders of the West, which is the U.S. and its junior partner of the U.K., they've been trying all they can do for the last eight years to have continent-wide escalation, and they've gotten it. He goes on. Though not entirely due to Putin's war, <laughs> Europe now faces fundamental challenges as big or bigger than the 2008 financial crash, Brexit or the pandemic. Yet many EU and UK politicians skulk in denial. If, as predicted, the gas stops flowing and the lights dim, it will not just be a matter of closed factories, lost jobs and depressed markets, freezing pensioners, hungry children, empty supermarket shelves, unaffordable cost of living increases, devalued wages, strikes and street protests point to the Sri Lanka style meltdowns. All because we are trying to provoke Russia into doing what they did. And now we've put sanctions on them. This is all the doing of NATO and the West. 100 percent. Russia wants to light all those lights. It wants to illuminate all those lights and power all those factories. It has a it just as Aaron said, it built a pipeline directly to Germany. It now it currently provides 40 percent of the energy uh, to Western Europe. So it this is all made up. And this is in The Guardian. And these are the people who call the gray zone disinformers. And the people like Jimmy Dore, they call us disinf spreaders of disinformation. This is the biggest garbage you've ever seen in the world. And it's, of course, written right by their chief lead foreign correspondent. And it's in a military industrial complex supported newspaper despite bilateral cooperation pledges a total russian cutoff could pit country against country further inflate prices and split the anti-moscow coalition in such a scenario putin would demand sanctions relief in return for resumed supplies that sounds reasonable <laughs> putin <laughs> if that happened putin would then demand something reasonable so you guys are sanctioning the shit out of him, and he's saying that Putin might cut off his gas supplies. You guys are the ones doing it, and that he's going to ask for an end to sanctions if he cuts off his gas supplies. 
just as he has over blockaded the Black Sea grain. So the reason why grain can't get out of the sea, uh, out of the Ukraine port, is because Ukraine mined their goddamn port and nobody wants to go in and out of it because nobody knows where those mines are. That's one reason. Yeah. Now, Ukraine also says that if they demine their ports, then that could invite further Russia attacks. That's their stated reason for not doing it. But and there has been recently an agreement reached brokered by Turkey that hopefully will resolve that. But look, Jimmy, regardless, I wish Russia hadn't invaded. I wish they could have found a different way to resolve their grievances. And I like to believe that they could have had, and, you know, that invasion was not their only option. But look, we live in the real world where they did. And the fact is, if people like Simon Tisdall and others don't like the fact that Russia invaded, they could have avoided that simply by having Ukraine simply declare neutrality before yes. the war. And implement the peace accords in the Donbass, the Minsk Accords, that they refused to implement. That would have done it. Instead, now, people like Simon Tisdall want to risk World War III and further immiserate their own, their own population in Europe just to deny Russia a victory inside Ukraine, which means in, in, accepting that Russia controls Crimea. It's not going back. And accepting now that the Donbass republics, which could have stayed a part of Ukraine if Ukraine had been willing to accept the Minsk Accords and not use the time to prepare for war, accepting that those republics are probably going to be either independent or a part of Russia now. That's just what it is. And then also accepting neutrality, which is the only sane response to any or solution anyway, because what good is it for anybody's security to have a NATO proxy that is deeply divided with a bunch of Russian speakers right, right on Russia's border? It's insanity. And that's the policy that these people support. So here, just he, this is, it gets worse. <laughs> he says it is President Joe Biden's too cautious leadership of NATO that has led Europe into this geopolitical cul-de-sac, even as a weakening euro slides below one dollar. So he's saying he wants Joe Biden and the West to ramp it up. The sanctions, economic aid and other non-military measures preferred by Biden were never going to be enough to bring Putin to heel. Some observers suspect a stalemate that slowly bleeds Russia suits U.S. purposes, whatever the collateral damage. Yes, right now in Putin, it's Putin who is bleeding Europe. Sanctions are backfiring or poorly enforced. So he's, he's speaking out of both of his sides of his mouth in his own fucking article. He's even saying that the sanctions are the things that's causing this and they have backfired and now that Europe and the West are feeling the pain of their own sanctions because they've bought, they have backfired. Yeah. Russia's <laughs> making more money than they were before. That, yeah, that's right. And the ruble is stronger than it was before the real war. That's right. That's right. So, uh, and Ukrainians aside, the pain is disproportionately felt by wealth, less wealthy European and developed. This is all you're doing in the UK and inside NATO in the United States. This is amazing. This is an I haven't seen an article this bad since Luke Harding did the thing about Paul Manafort meeting Julian Assange inside the most surveilled building in the world, and they couldn't find a picture of him. That was amazing. But the Young Turks reported it breathlessly and uncritically. The Jimmy, obvi- let me say, Go ahead. Let me say, I have a new article up on my sub stack, and it's called that in Ukraine, there's a proxy war on the planet. So the, U- the U.S. is not only sacrificing Ukrainians for its uh, hegemonic goals against Russia, it's sacrificing the rest of the planet. So when he talks about how, yes, this crisis is hurting the less uh, wealthy in impoverished countries, that's a deliberate result of U.S. sanctions, U.S. policy that are cutting off Russian exports to those countries, including grain and fertilizer. And the African Union, the head of the African Union, Mickey Saul, said that U.S. sanctions are making it a lot harder to feed our people. And the New York Times recently had an article where they said that African countries are facing what the Times called a dilemma. On the one hand, you have the prospect of hundreds of thousands of starving people in Africa. But if you feed them, the Times says, you risk, quote, displeasing a powerful Western ally. OK, unquote. So Africa has to choose between displeasing a powerful Western ally in Washington or feeding starving people. That's yeah. where we're at. That's yeah. the choice that has been pushed onto the world by the U.S. proxy war policy. And then he admits that he knows how this is going to end. Just as we've said since this war started, we all know how this war is going to end. It's going to end however Putin wants. And. Uh, with Ukraine remaining neutral and out of a uh, neutral and out of NATO. And so here, listen to what he says here. He says the obvious escape route is a land for peace deal with Putin, which is what we said is going to happen. Exactly. 
since this thing started. Agreed over Ukraine's dead bodies. That was Ukraine's choice to do to fight this. They didn't have to. This kind of shoddy sellout has influential advocate. I don't, I don't even care about the rest of that. Yes, such a deal would also be a precedent setting disaster. So ending this war would be a disaster, according to this knucklehead from The Guardian, for future peace and security across the continent and globally, too. Just think Taiwan or Estonia. It would destroy the sovereign integrity of democratic Ukraine. Oh, I just... Uh, go ahead, Jimmy, Eric. what destroyed the sovereign integrity of democratic Ukraine was in 2014. That's right. When the U.S. backed the overthrow of the democratically elected president Yanukovych and used far-right fascists as the muscle for that coup and helped install people in the government that the U.S. personally selected. You've played the phone call many times of Victoria Nuland picking the new yes. Ukrainian government, uh, imposing them, uh, imposing in power far-right uh, fascists who cracked down on Russian speakers uh, in the Donbass, oversaw massacres like the Odessa massacre where dozens of Russian yes. speakers were burned alive, setting off a proxy war in the Donbass. That's what destroyed the, the sovereign integrity of democratic Ukraine. So these people don't care about Ukrainians. That's they right. They don't care about Ukraine's democracy. They care about using Ukraine as a proxy to weaken Russia. And they're getting the result. Russia's finally fighting back in a really catastrophic way. So his, here's, of course, go you know, ahead. And of course, well, just also, and meanwhile, the U.S. is occupying one third of Syria, Syria, doing exactly what Russia is accused of doing in Ukraine, which is stealing its grain and its wheat. And it's even, you know, in Syria, it's even more egregious because there's been a 10 year war that's left a lot, lot, large parts of the country in ruins. And the U.S. stealing more of Syria's resources have made it, made it very hard for Syria to feed itself. The people don't care about the, the, the sovereign integrity of Syria. They want to destroy the sovereign integrity of Syria, just like they want to destroy the sovereign integrity of Ukraine and anywhere else that can be used as a tool for U.S. hegemony. So here's his big idea. Here's his big plan that we should be implementing in Ukraine. Ready? Fortunately, there is an alternative. The alternative from the Ukraine giving land to Russia, the eastern part, the Donbass, which has seceded from the country since they overthrew their government in a right-wing coup. Fortunately, there is an alternative. Using NATO's overwhelming power to decisively turn the military tide. What he's saying is, don't let Ukraine's military fight Russia. Let's let NATO and the United States and the UK go into Ukraine and start a war with Russia. Now, I don't know if you guys know what that's called. That's called World War Three. That's what he's advocating for in the papers of The Guardian. I, I, I can't even advocate for killing one person and they'll take down my channel. He's advocating in a corporate funded newspaper for starting World War Three that would kill everybody. Uh, as previously argued here, he's this is him. He says direct targeted forceful Western action to repulse Russia's repulsive horde is not a vote for a third world war. And it's not a vote for a third world war just because he says it. That doesn't make it so. He's just saying that. But if we did do this, it would be a vote for World War Three, and it would be World War Three. So the fact that he just says that it's not is just him bullshitting more because this guy is a pathological maniac who spews propaganda like nothing I've ever seen. So it's he says this. So starting World War Three is the only feasible way to bring this escalating horror to a swift conclusion while ensuring Putin and those who might emulate him do not profit from lawless butchery. We're occupying a third of a country right next door called Syria. And which third of that country do you think we're occupying? The oil fields. We're committing a genocide in Yemen. We're trying to overthrow a, go uh, a government in uh, Ethiopia, right? We're doing it all over the Somalia. We're still doing it. We're starving the people in Afghanistan that we just occupied for 20 years. This is all garbage. This is Western hegemony imperialism. That's all you get from the Guardian, and that's exactly what this is. And they get paid handsomely to do it, just like they get paid handsomely at the Intercept to do nothing. Oh, go ahead, Aaron. You want to comment on this? Uh, I think you said it all, J.P. OK, so we it goes on. It gets even worse. But I, I, I just want to remind everybody 
That's what this is. Putin is already at war with Europe. There is only one way to stop him. This guy's name is Simon Tisdall, and he should be in a white jacket and taken away from publishing for the rest of his life. But he'll be given a raise because he's advocating for the slaughter of humanity, which is profitable. That's what's exactly happening. And some people called it out. LOL, he's weaponizing the results of our own sanctions. How dare he? They're talking about Putin. Oh, he's weaponizing the results of our own sanctions against him. Uh, here's here's what Caitlin Johnstone says. She says, The Guardian Simon Tisdall defends his vote for a third world war by saying that it's not a vote for the third world war. <laughs> So-called journalist Simon Tisdall uh, at The Guardian exists to make war for the UK, UK regime. These journalists should be held accountable for prevention of peaceful resolution and deaths in Syria and of Ukraine citizens who disappeared through thick narratives. They are the weapons of mass destruction. He means, he's talking about those journalists are weapons of mass destruction. Oh, here's Aaron Mate. He says, I nominate Simon Tisdell and the entire Guardian editorial team for the, for the front lines of the World War III they're advocating for. So you know the people who write that stuff and advocate for this kind of intervention are never going to be the people on the front lines, and that's the point Aaron was making. Well said. And Jimmy, also, I mean, they've established that they're terrible journalists. They're bad at their job. So why not try out something else? Try out something like fighting <laughs> in the front lines of the World War III you're shilling for maybe, every single day. Why not? Maybe they'll be good at that. Maybe they'll be a good soldier, good mercenary, yeah. and they get paid. So, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for helping break this down. Everybody should check out Aaron Mate's uh, recent article at his Substack at mate.substack.com about the Ukraine fiasco and you'll get the, the real dope, the straight dope about what's happening there, not stuff like that. Holy cow. That was, I got to go throw up. I have to go, I have to go clav to cleanse myself or take a, something that gives you, you know, whew. I can't. That was unbelievable. That was real. That was, that was worse than Luke Harding. Would you agree? Or it's neck and neck. Yeah, no, that's worse than Luke Harding because. Luke Harding's job is to agitate for World War III, but I don't see him directly calling for it. Simon Tisdall is coming out with it. <laughs> and it's so sad. The Guardian was once a serious newspaper. It really was. And they've kicked out anyone who could think critically and independently. And now this is what they produce. So I'm honored that I was recently attacked by them over my work on Syria, because what better honor is it than to be attacked by people who want to have World War III and are threatened by those like us who don't yeah if they liked you that's when you know you're doing something wrong when the guardian's patting you on the back you're like uh oh i'm doing it wrong okay all right everybody check out aaron mate thank you so much for spending time with us we'll see you next time sacramento back here in los angeles bakersfield indianapolis louisville cincinnati tulsa oklahoma city go to jimmydorecomedy.com for a link for all the tickets for all our shows